And so our uh, next speaker is uh, Andreas Hulsing. I don't know if any of you were here at the fall conference in 2019. Yeah, <laughs> then uh, you may remember that uh, Andreas did a presentation on uh, post-quantum uh, crypto as well. was uh, busy with uh, the uh, NIST competition for the, the different algorithms and now it's coming to an end, this competition. And uh, you all know that the quantum computer is uh, at the doorstep. So and, uh, Andreas is doing the good work to do to make our systems resilient uh, or the cryptography uh, against the quantum computer. So the floor is yours, Andreas. Thank you. Um, Mr. Macbuck? Yeah, sounds good. So uh, thanks for the <coughs> invitation. It was, I think, the last the last conference before the lockdown. Um, so it's actually nice to do something like this again in person. So I will talk a bit about the, the NIST post-quantum crypto standardization process, um, about how it proceeded and the schemes that were selected, and uh, will briefly touch upon what I think uh, will be the next topics to go to. Um, <coughs> I should give a bit of a warning. So this talk is clearly biased. I'm a theory person in general, so I'm doing proofs and algorithm designs. I'm not doing that much implementation work. Um, I'm talking to people doing implementation work, but uh, that's about it. And I was involved in three submissions, uh, Sphinx Plus, which was one of the selected schemes, and True and MQDSS. So uh, my view might be a bit biased also in that direction. So let me briefly talk about uh, why this whole topic is there. So uh, there is this whole quantum hype and everyone is talking about uh, what you cannot do with quantum and this is the new solution to everything. Um, the bad thing is if we actually manage to build full-scale quantum computers, they will break our crypto. And uh, just to briefly recap uh, why this or where this happens, Think about Alice that wants to buy tea and uh, goes online, goes to some tea shop, and then uh, eventually wants to pay. So she wants a secure connection with the server that she never saw before. So uh, she will start a connection, then will get um, <coughs> a public key and a certificate that says this public key belongs to this shop. And then they will run public key cryptography to establish a shared secret key, and then this secret key they will use to actually secure the connection. All right, so this is something that most likely most of you will have seen before. Um, and the tricky part here is the public key cryptography. So secret key cryptography we can build kind of in an engineering fashion. So this is a study where you have best practices and you try to shuffle bits uh, for long enough that people cannot unscramble things and you mix in a shared secret, which makes things a lot easier in the end. What we have here is actually, we start from some computationally hard problem. So the most popular probably is the RSA assumption, um, which is somewhat related to factoring. Um, then the discrete logarithm problem or the decisional diffie hellman problem. And from these, we build then cryptographic schemes. And what we usually show is that um, if you cannot solve this hard problem, then you cannot break the scheme. Okay? Now, <coughs> this guy proposed, uh, is Peter W. Shaw, and he proposed an algorithm in 1994, which actually allows you to solve the factoring of large numbers and the discrete logarithm problem, and thereby breaks all these assumptions on the left-hand side. And I really mean all. Like uh, They can all either be broken if you can factor or if you can solve discrete logarithms. And so in consequence, if these problems are not hard anymore, our schemes are not secure. And so if our schemes are not secure, our connection is not secure, you see where I'm going. So <coughs> um, now you might say we don't have quantum computers yet. Why should I care? Well, uh, my answer to this is always it's a question of risk assessment. If you don't start acting now, then you're essentially making a bet that never anyone will come up with a quantum computer. And the reason is that um, we have this problem of de um, store now, decrypt later. Right? So you can, can just store encrypted traffic now, wait until the quantum computer is there and decrypt. And if your information is still relevant in, say, 10, 20 years, 
then this actually might be a problem. Who would do this? Well, the NSA is pretty public about this, like you can download this picture on their website. They even tell you that it was 1.5 billion to build this data center in the desert of Utah, which has the sole purpose of actually storing encrypted traffic nowadays in the hope of being able to decrypt it at some point. Doesn't have to be a quantum computer, can also be um, advanced as encrypt analysis, but um, currently the best bet for them, I think, is uh, the quantum computer. <coughs> the other thing is um, we're building systems which do not just live somewhere for five years. Uh, I just had a discussion over lunch about uh, control systems in industry, which are, they are living alive for like uh, several uh, days now. And uh, similarly, if you shoot a, a satellite into space, you first have a development time, which easily takes more than 10 years. And then you have to be able to control these things for at least 10 more years. So we already talk about 20 years that you have to be able to communicate securely with your satellite. So you need at least a signature algorithm which allows you to securely send updates to this thing. Um, in a similar, maybe less severe setting, you have this also for cars. I mean, those at least you can call into the garage and, uh, and update them manually. So how do we build something that resists quantum computers? Um, this is the, the scratch from uh, the classical setting. Um, and the answer is simply, we replace these problems. So we take problems, which we assume to be hard, even for a quantum computer, and those problems, some of you might have seen, are taken from um, <coughs> lattice theory, um, coding theory, the theory of solving multivariate quadratic equations, and just uh, plain hash functions, and assuming they are security properties. And so in 2016, NIST offered or opened a call to select cryptographic schemes for standardization that actually resist quantum computer aided attacks. And um, <coughs> this was, uh, they called it the standardization process because they were planning to select more than one scheme. Everyone called it the competition, so I will stick uh, with the competition. I think they also gave up by now. Now, the first thing that you might ask is, uh, what is there actually to do? So research for post-quantum crypto started knowingly around 2000. So this was when the first works were there, which actually advertised their results with, hey, this also resists quantum computers. Um, the actual proposals date back to the beginning of public key cryptography. So hash-based signatures, for example, are from the late 70s and uh, classic McAleese or uh, McAleese um, public key encryption scheme based on coding theories also from the late 70s. And this is when we actually had the proposal of public key crypto. Um, in addition, there's just a handful of schemes actually known and it's not likely that someone will just come up with a new scheme within the matter of, uh, of a year. Because as I said, so there's not that much engineering, you need these hard problems, and then there's a few design principles how to move from there to actual schemes. So why not just pick one? And the answer is there's a million of details and trade-offs. So for example, <coughs> as a case study, look at lattice-based encryption. This was the kind of scheme that was submitted the most to the next competition. And essentially every scheme falls under this outline. So this is a scheme proposed uh, by Regev in 2004 and then um, refined by Lindner, Peikert and Regev in 2010, I think. And <coughs> you have a public key that consists of something called A and uh, you might think of it as a matrix and a vector B. And this B value um, <coughs> is computed like this. So you take a secret S and then you take uh, an error vector E, and you compute this uh, linear combination, and um, actually the LWE assumption, which is one of the lattice-based assumptions, says um, <coughs> this here for a random B is indistinguishable from this here, okay? And what you eventually will do is you compute more, more of these samples, so that happens here, and then you do kind of a one-time pad with an encoding <coughs> of the message, and then the decryption computes a bit uh, with the secret and the values you sent. You see everything cancels nicely. You're left with a few terms which are small in some sense. And 
the encoding of the message. And so if the encoding is good, this is like a small error, and then I can decode and get my message back. Now you might say, wow, this is a bit uh, imprecise. I mean, this is like a rough sketch. Yes, there is really a lot of things that you have to decide about. So what is this A? Is this a matrix? Is this a polynomial? Is this a matrix of polynomials? These are all options which actually appeared in proposals. Um, these S and E values here, we've got a bunch of them. What distribution are they chosen from? Are they uniform? Are they Gaussian? If they are Gaussian, like uh, what's the standard deviation of that Gaussian? Um, I said here we need that these are small so that we can decode. What does small mean? Is this a two norm? Is this an infinity norm? Um, <coughs> And finally, we've got some encoding here, so also this has to be chosen. And then there's, of course, a lot more details which I'm omitting here. And um, this is just summarizing this if someone reads the slides later. Um, but then you actually just got a public key encryption scheme. What NIST asked for is a key encapsulation mechanism. So this is, um, think of a public key encryption scheme that's only used to exchange symmetric keys. And then you can actually let the scheme choose the key, and that makes your design a lot easier. And so <clears throat> this public key encryption scheme is only passively secure, and there's a generic transform which makes it actively secure. This is called the Fujisaki Okamoto transform. And also there, again, you've got a bunch of actual options. You can do explicit or implicit rejection. This is the question, if something goes wrong, do you actually output a failure symbol, or do you output a random bit string? Um, there was, in the beginning, um, the proposal to add a key confirmation hash, which is just a, a hash of the exchange secret key because this allowed better <coughs> security proofs. Um, when the competition actually, like the submission deadline passed, it turned out that this was not necessary for the proofs anymore, so then most of the teams removed it, some others kept it because you never know what. Maybe this helps against side channel attacks or something like this. Um, <coughs> you can include the public key into all your hash function calls because this might give you multi-user security, but if you do so, do you just include an identifier? Do you just include a hash? Um, do you instead include the first n bytes of the key? So you have to make all these kind of decisions and this goes on and on and on. And so <coughs> in, uh, after one year, um, there were 82 submissions collected of which 69 were complete and proper, so they just fulfilled uh, all the requirements, like the formal requirements posed by NIST, like they needed an implementation, they needed documentation, and so on. And out of these were 45 camps, and 21 of them were based on lattices. So they made 21 different versions of this one scheme. Uh, some of them were really so similar that they started merging, um, but in the end, there were all these different options on the table, and actually, um, the remaining were also not that different. Most of them were from coding theory, and again, they looked pretty similar following a really similar uh, receipt. And so, <coughs> after this collection, the goal of these competitions, we did this for AES before and for, um, for SHA-3. I mean, the thing is, you essentially throw your schemes into the ring, and then you start beating on the other stuff until everyone besides you uh, is off, and then, you hope you win this way. And so the main thing to figure out here is, of course, which schemes are secure, because this is kind of the most important metric. Um, and if you figure that out, then you've got like the side conditions. So which trade-offs uh, or details actually give you the best performance? Um, which schemes can you actually the easiest implement securely and on different platforms? So like the, the functional um, bony, if you want to say so. And so the main point was verifying security, and it took, I think, six hours <laughs> until uh, a colleague from Eindhoven broke the first scheme. And I think the people from the scheme until now didn't accept that they got broken, but uh, um, this is actually a really nice paper to read uh, if you have some time at some point, because they were convinced that they have an um, unconditionally secure public key encryption scheme, which just cannot work, but uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> And actually, so over the first three weeks, 12 schemes immediately got broken or so <laughs> severely hit that um, NIST eventually took them out and uh, five more were withdrawn. 
And so this was a bit, I mean, this was an open competition. Everyone could submit. Um, what we did is we looked for the most esoteric looking schemes. And those actually fell pretty easily. And then um, you had some cases where actually people built a reasonable scheme but made uh, some design mistake. I mean, this can just happen. And then uh, those were also caught pretty fast. And then over the next four months, you just had four more broken or significantly attacked. And so in the end, 18 schemes were withdrawn or rejected after the first round, which ended, I think, beginning of 2019. And then a long silence happened. So um, there were some issues and proofs which are found, like uh, that, that actually the proof did not hold. Then these proofs got corrected, but this did really not, uh, not concern the security. And the main thing was discussions about the precise security levels. So can you actually speed up an attack to shave off a few more bits, right? So how much time does it take to solve a specific problem? And this was something that people were still looking into. Um, <clears throat> but then this year happened and uh, we learned that we have to be afraid of what our laptops do on a weekend. I'm not sure on how far you followed the news, but uh, beginning of the year, a uh, colleague uh, from formerly Leuven, who is now at IBM in Zurich, broke Rainbow, which was one of the three finalist signature schemes. And actually, I think as a counter attack, the people from Rainbow broke his scheme. <laughs> so these were two multivariate schemes which were in the finals, and uh, they both got broken entirely. Like, uh, And if you want to have really fun, you can look at the NIST mailing list. There is uh, the ABC coin which still believes that Rainbow is the best scheme and they write hilarious messages. Um, but actually for this coin also, uh, Lorenz from the last attack and another colleague uh, <coughs> actually gave a forgery for one of the keys with the most uh, coins in the net. So you might not want to invest in this. The second attack, which just happened this summer, was someone broke psych. Um, Psyche is an isogeny-based key exchange that was uh, pretty surprising. Um, and actually, to, to put this into context, so the first two schemes, Rainbow and this, the scheme of Watt uh, gems, they came from a class of MQ-based signature schemes, which have a long history of schemes being proposed, broken, <coughs> refined, broken, refined, broken. So this was not really surprising. At this point it was a bit unexpected because the schemes were out there for quite some time and no one broke them. So people were thinking, ah, maybe this worked for once, but um, actually the scheme MQDSS that I was involved exactly tried to tackle this problem, um, building an MQ-based scheme which really relies on the hardness of a random instance of MQ, because what they do is they build a system of equation with a lot of structure which you can easily solve and then they scramble it and you, they hope you cannot unscramble it. Well, and it turns out you can unscramble it and thereby you can solve the system. So as I said, unexpected but not totally surprising. For the isogenies, um, these were the latest add to the family of post-quantum crypto. You might have seen I didn't have these on my first slide about the problems because that slide is a bit older and um, people started looking at this I think about 2015, 2016. And so I always said a bit like, ah, these are really new. I'm not sure if I would bet my shorts on this. Um, but over time, they actually did accumulate trust. Many smart people tried to break the schemes. Uh, Lawrence, <laughs> who I talked about before, um, tried to do his PhD on breaking this and didn't, didn't manage. And uh, several people in our group actually worked on this. And they didn't fight an angle. And so I would say at this point, the break was really surprising. If you ask other people in the community, they will tell you like, ah, this is a clear consequence of events. Um, many people involved said um, it's not. I mean, they found a 20 year old result which essentially solved it. I'm not sure why people missed this, um, but nevertheless. The good thing is, so these were these two schemes, and also surprising, I mean, somehow people were warning about this. Um, 
The good thing is I think even more people looked at Lattice Space Crypto because this was kind of the main proposal or family of proposals. And there was no significant break of any scheme there. Like nothing that really significantly scratched things. Um, there were some not submitted schemes, but for example, some old fully homomorphic encryption scheme based on lattices, which had really overstretched uh, parameters um, that got broken a longer time ago. But um, in this parameter regime that's used for, for camps and signatures, nothing happened. The only thing is that attacks actually got a bit better, so they managed to shave off some bits of security, which means you have to increase uh, the parameters a bit. But um, this is kind of what's to be expected if more and more people look at these schemes. <clears throat> and then I said uh, further criteria were performance and ease of implementation, and these were the main reasons actually for schemes to be rejected after round two. So for example, uh, MQDSS, this proposal of ours uh, got kicked out after round two because it was just not competitive with the other schemes. Because that one was secure, but had signatures of like 20 kilobytes, which then they said like, yeah, not interested. And so <clears throat> we had these two rounds and then Round three was uh, already a pre-selection, so NIST said um, we've got some finalists and some alternates. And so for CAMS, the schemes were Kyber, which was actually selected, which is a module LWE-based scheme, so it takes a matrix of polynomials um, <coughs> and adds a random error. Um, then Sabre is essentially the same scheme, but it rounds instead of uh, adding an error. Andrew has a similar design but relies on the Andrew assumption which dates back to the, to the mid-90s. That's a random error. Um, in comparison, you've got Andrew Prime which does essentially the same but over a slightly different ring with less structure and then has a random uh, error and a rounded version. Frodo again does the same scheme but uses plain LWE with a random error. So you've got still a bunch of different options of the same thing. Um, you had, in addition, code-based schemes. Classic Macaulay's was a finalist which uses GOPA codes, which behave more or less like random codes. And then you had two proposals which used more structured codes. Um, well, and we had Psyche, which uh, got out. And for the signatures, we had um, actually a different point of view because these were all different proposals except of these uh, MQ-based schemes, which kind of have the same approach. So Dilithium, which is one of the selected schemes, uses some form of LWE and SIS, so these are lattice-based problems, and then uses a concept called Fiat Chamir with the boards. Falcon uses a different design concept called full domain hash. This is kind of what RSA signatures do. Um, so the Fiat Chamir with the boards is kind of what ECDSA does in some sense. Um, and Falcon uses Entro. Then we had our MQ-based schemes. Then we got Picnic, which um, is a really funny scheme because they use, they simulate an interactive, like a multi-party computation in which the parties prove that they know a pre-image of a one-way function which is built from some block cipher. The problem is, as block cipher, they used low MC, which is a block cipher designed especially to be efficient with multi-party computation. Um, but so this is by far not as well understood as most of our block ciphers, and there were a bunch of attacks um, which did not break low MC in the setting Picnic uses it, but in many related settings, so this uh, made people kind of skeptical of this approach. And then there's Sphinx Plus, which uh, relies on the security of hash functions and uses some dedicated design, which is inspired essentially by, by Merkle signatures. And so the winners, I mean, I spoiled this, but I guess uh, you likely have read this. Um, for signatures, we've got three schemes. The lithium was chosen as the main scheme to be used, like the, the general purpose scheme. And then Falcon was chosen <coughs> because it has smaller signatures. And they were saying, okay, there might be applications which need really even smaller signatures than the lithium because they are not by that much smaller. 
and can tolerate, which is a problem of uh, Falcon, the implementation difficulty. So Falcon needs floating point arithmetic, which is a pain to implement, especially on small devices. So um, that's the issue with that. And then to not only rely on um, lattice assumptions, they added Sphinx Plus, um, which has, well, this will not win a speed or size competition, but gives you conservative security. for So for things like document signatures or software updates, I think this is perfectly fine. And what was a bit surprising, on the CAM side, they only picked Kyber, which has kind of a, the best overall performance, but um, is a single scheme. So if lattices are broken, then uh, we're in trouble to some extent. So the reasoning for signatures, I, I said this before, um, so NIST wanted diversification and Sphinx was essentially the only option left. Um, for CAMS, this was a bit surprising because on the one hand, you had still um, more conservative lattice schemes. So Frodo removed all the structure essentially. So MLW is a somewhat structured assumption while Frodo just used uh, plain LWE, which is significantly better understood. Um, but these were rejected based on their performance and because they said they didn't want to select uh, two letter schemes. Uh, Sabre lost in comparison to, um, to Kyber because rounding is not as well understood as adding random errors. And for the code based schemes, most of us were actually expecting that they will standardize Macalese because that was also the only finalist that was non lattice based. And my impression after reading the, the NIST report again is that they actually decided to wait because if they would now make this decision, the other code based schemes would be out. So um, they wanted to see if maybe the other code based schemes survive for longer so that the structure is not harmful and then they would have a bit more, a bit better schemes with general performance. One painful open topic actually is IPR. So there were a lot of people which uh, thought it's a great idea to write um, um, patents. And this is actually a pain. This was uh, something that delayed the final decision by NIST for at least half a year because they started negotiating with different parties. So the French state had some um, IPR, which I think is now handled. There was uh, Jin Tai Ding, a colleague uh, from the US, who had some patent which was disputed if this is actually will hold, but no one wanted to risk it. And seemingly there are one or two other things and um, these all concern Kyber. And so for that reason, Andrew is still kind of a fallback. And for example, Google currently uses Andrew for, their, for securing the internal communication. Um, they were running a TLS experiment with Andrew, I think in starting 2019. And so that one they continued to use uh, for securing the internal networks. So what are the next steps? The first thing is um, for signatures, actually, I'm not sure where this comes from, but NIST is not entirely satisfied. They are looking for a second general purpose signature scheme, which is not based on lattices. And they are also interested on schemes with very small signatures and fast verification. So they name certificate transparency as a reason, but um, I did not yet understand where exactly this uh, helps if you have enormous public keys. But um, <coughs> this is something that uh, they are looking for submissions next year and then we will have an ongoing competition to select new signature schemes. Um, in addition, the next thing is really build the stuff into our existing protocols. And um, this is something that most organizations actually held off a bit. So if you are involved in IETF, you might have seen they, they were stalling and said like, uh, first let NIST finish. Now NIST finished and so things start getting rushed. Um, the problem is we over and over see that there is no post-quantum version of Diffie-Hellman. 
that if you Hellman was really like uh, some special thing, and it seems a bit like the inherent structure of Diffie Hellman is exactly what makes it, like the algebraic additional properties, are exactly what makes it vulnerable to quantum attacks. Um, so this is a problem then. <coughs> post-quantum crypto performance is not the same as ECC performance. People got used to ECC, and now they have to deal with at least a factor 10 blow up in, in sizes, um, which many people have a hard time accepting. Um, and then especially in Europe, agencies require hybrid construction. So the US don't ask for this, but um, the BSI and uh, ANSI in France um, require that you use post-quantum crypto together with elliptic curve crypto. And so this also has to be built in. And uh, this means we actually have to redesign our protocols. One way to do this is uh, to, to deal with the performances that you can actually um, build more stuff on, on CAMs because signatures turn also out to be less performant than, uh, than the key encapsulation part. Um, and otherwise you can also look at uh, my impression is for a long time, public key crypto was really cheap, so we used it whenever possible, and quite a, like uh, really a lot, while in some cases, symmetric key crypto might work. For example, you might not want to ratchet that often uh, if you're using public key crypto compared to now. Um, for basic communication security, I think we're well underway. So we've got... Uh, PQ WireGuard is a VPN proposal out. Uh, we just published PQ Noise, which is a general authenticated key exchange framework. Um, people from Nijmegen published uh, ChemTLS, which is a chem-based TLS version where you can really plug in post-quantum chems. And then also from Eindhoven, there's a proposal called PQ Connect, which does just a, an entirely new communication protocol. Um, <coughs> But more advanced things are still open. So if you look at, for example, PAIC, which uh, your ID cards and passports actually use when you go through border control, um, there is no decent proposal yet. Um, things like deniable authenticated key exchange, what uh, in some sense signaled us uh, in, the <coughs> in the initial key exchange phase or which OTR uses. I think there's no proposal for this yet. So all these kind of more fancy crypto things, um, we're still looking for proposals. Um, well, and then we have to do all the dirty work, right? So we have to specify um, key and object formats. We have to specify PQC versions of protocols in general. Um, we have to decide how to do these hybrid things right. That turns out to be also a big discussion. And we have to think about how to smoothly transition. I mean, we cannot just switch and let people that didn't switch yet um, <coughs> fall back. And with encryption, this is not that easy. So I'm currently involved in, in the Open PGP working group, and uh, this is actually something really to discuss. So to leave some kind of time of question, I will just briefly touch on the last topic that I'm working on especially. We have learned that the proofs for post-quantum crypto turn out to be far more complex than security proofs in, uh, for traditional schemes. So um, during the competition, I think at least half of the schemes had at some point a flaw in their proof. Maybe it's also just that we found them because this time more people looked at these papers and uh, <laughs> usually the proofs just end up in the panics and no one reads them and cares. Um, which might be the even worse case. Um, and there's a lot of ways to fail. Like you can have a wrong proof. This was uh, what we had for the tight security proof of Sphinx in the beginning. You can prove the wrong statement. So at some point um, our Sphinx proof just showed that um, the scheme is secure if your hash function gives you some form of second premature resistance. And we even had a proof showing that uh, this form of second pre-image resistance is tightly achieved by a good hash function. So if you hash, have a hash function that behaves like a random oracle, everything is fine. Guess what? SHA-2 is not a random oracle. So actually, for SHA-2, you can get a better attack, so you lose a few bits uh, in security. I mean, this, this did not destroy the scheme at all. It was just annoying, and so we had to change the way we built our internal functions from SHA-2. And, um, <coughs> well... 
this was essentially just because we stopped proving things too early and we had this also in other schemes. Um, or for example, um, Kyber uses an FO transform which doesn't have a security proof because they decided we do a few things a bit different. I mean, what could go wrong? And then uh, towards the end of the competition, people came like, hey, wait, actually what you're doing is something we cannot prove. We don't get this working. And um, <coughs> the final thing we had are, are two loose bounds. So um, we had this, for example, for MQDSS. We gave a security proof and uh, we related the hardness of breaking the scheme to the hardness of solving the MQ problem. And there was a polynomial loss in there, which uh, we thought is essentially because our proof techniques are not that good. And so we thought like, yeah, okay, then we can select parameters as if we had a tight proof and everything is fine. And it took a year and then people came up with an attack that actually matched the bad bound and we had to um, select different parameters. Um, so, how do we deal with this? Uh, this is something that I'm currently really involved in. Um, I mean, in general, the good news is we only had to slightly lower or got slightly lower security or e even could easily fix things. Um, but the bad news is it, there's no guarantee that this will always be the case. Some of you might have heard about OCB2. It was a scheme became an ISO standard, um, and I think the only reason it was not used was that um, Phil Rogaway had a patent on this, which he gave away royalty-free, but um, not for military use. So he just had an exclaimer that this must not be used in the military. For that reason, it did not get widely deployed. <laughs> Turns out it can be entirely broken, although it, it had a security proof. Um, one way out, and I think... Uh, this is a nice way out is machine checked proofs. So you try to convince the computer that your proof is right. Um, that allows you to catch wrong proofs. And we actually uh, just ran into one. Um, and you can even do nice things like you can link your proof down to the optimized implementation nowadays with our tools. Um, the problem is this is intensive work. Um, like doing the full stack is something that you easily have a team of five, six people busy with for a year. Um, and so this is work in progress. Uh, we had work published on Sabre, verifying the internal scheme. Um, essentially, most of the parts of Kyber are by now verified. It's just not published because people are more busy writing these proofs than, than publishing them. We're currently finishing work on dilithium for the for the proof and um, for Sphinx we get at least the core part where there was the previous flaw in the proof verified so this is already done um, but yeah this is also still work in progress to get the full thing um, yes and I think these are the, the next topics to look at if you want more information we wrote uh, two studies for the European Cybersecurity Agency Anissa, um, <coughs> one about the schemes and one about next steps necessary. Um, if you want to know more about post-quantum cryptography, we ran a school in 2019 and one in 2017, and all the talks and, uh, and lectures are online, all the materials. And if you're interested in these machine-checked proofs, uh, we started a, a project, which is just a community effort to, to do these... Uh, these proofs and build a library of formally verified post-quantum crypto. And that can be found at famosacrypto.org. Thanks. Thank you, Andreas. So, are there any questions? <laughs> if, if not, I can start with one. You have five minutes for questions or so, I think. A bit more. Yeah, I do have yeah you do. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, um, I need to like digest it in my head for a second. So how much, because you know, we're like, don't write your own crypto, don't write your own crypto. So you're effectively writing your own crypto. So how much actually reinventing old stuff and inventing new stuff is how, how, how does it basically, because how much reuse of, you know, existing, let's say math and then I would, you know, because because we're getting into a realm where you know things are new. Yeah. 
you know, the process of like inventing totally new approaches, basically. So rather than, you know, reusing, so we end up, you know, with a quantum resistant Diffie Hellman, for instance, somewhere along the way. So how, what's the ratio of like you reusing versus inventing like brand new stuff? Giving a ratio is hard to say, but uh, I mean, the point is, all this stuff is relatively new. Uh, so for example, for lattice space crypto, a lot of things happened over the last 10 years. And so these things are really recent, and so they are also more error prone. And these things just really get more complicated. If you look at um, arguing how hard it is for a quantum algorithm to find a pre-image of a random hash function versus just arguing how hard it is for a classical algorithm, for the classical algorithm, I give you a counting argument that I can convince you in five minutes at, at most uh, that this is correct, I think. For the quantum algorithm, this is already kind of a one to two pager because you, you actually go via reductions to some hard problems. Um, this is also, I mean, our students get more and more trained in this. Um, so like uh, I sent my students to actually follow lectures on quantum information theory and so then you have the background and can do these things too, but it's different math that you need. And I have a hard time deciding if it's more complicated math because I'm used to the old stuff and uh, have to deal now with the new stuff or if it's really more complicated. This, uh, So, uh, so I noticed that uh, NIST is not yet finished, that they're open to new uh, submissions for the competition, but y you're not participating anymore. Well, oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, so but the question is why not? Or because I'm actually currently, so let's put it like this, I'm currently not actively looking to participate. I'm currently involved with one scheme that um, that likely will get submitted, and uh, but, but I'm not pushing to be on this submission because uh, we actually now still have to figure out, like to, to write the standards. So actually today the, the next NIST uh, conference is running, so I will later give a talk there. And we have to discuss um, how to proceed with Sphinx. There are still a few things that we're thinking of maybe changing or adopting proposals. Um, and especially also selecting new parameter sets. So this discussion is still ongoing and um, this took a lot of time and I currently find these machine check proofs really a lot more interesting because uh, I think we're producing stuff more and more and we don't manage to verify this. Um, and the other thing is actually, I think proposals that are acceptable for NIST now will likely be code-based signatures. And this is not really my, my main expertise. So there I'm involved in generic proofs, but not in, in the actual schemes or the, the core math mathematical part. Um, I have another question. So I noticed the slide with all the implementations, but uh, I, I think one implementation was missing uh, because this, after, uh, this evening we will have a, a PGP uh, a key signing uh, party. And I know for a fact that you have been busy uh, uh, impl doing the post-quantum implementation of uh, PGP. Yes, but that's not finished. So oh, we're it's not finished. Uh, oh. that's, that's what I wanted to ask. Can so I, I create a uh, post-quantum? There's uh, actually, so um, there is, this is work with the, with the company. So I'm just uh, working as a subcontractor for them. Um, and they have an implementation which I think they want to be done at least the first version beginning of next year. Um, the problem is that we first need a standard for this. And so there is also, um, 
there's an online service that does PGP um, proton mail. Um, are also looking into this, and we're discussing with them quite a lot. The proton mail. Yes, okay. and I think so. Everybody has kind of a first uh, implementation going, but um, it's nothing interoperable yet, and we're really hashing out things like how do you compute, like with what with what key are you encrypting if you're doing hybrid? How do you combine these two keys? Do you hash them together? Do you use something more complicated? Um, I mean, you should not use the XOR for reasons, but um, there's a bunch <laughs> of, of still open detail questions. Okay, so at the earliest, uh, the next conference then, not, not tonight, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions? No, if not, then uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Thank you.